Hi, you're listening to the Modern Club Management Podcast with me, your host, Ed Chapman. This podcast takes the lived experiences and knowledge of some of the leading figures and thinkers from the world of club management and beyond, all so that they can become your teacher and elevate your performance. Whether you're looking to start a career in club management, are a seasoned club manager at a world leading club, or work elsewhere within this wonderful industry, there will be powerful messages and key takeaways that can help you in your career or personal life. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy today's episode. This episode is brought to you by Sweda. Sweda is the social learning platform that delivers high quality blended learning with human connection. Sueda is on a mission to revolutionize the digital learning space through restoring the critical element of human engagement that has gotten lost in online learning. The technology provides everything organizations or individuals need on one single platform to achieve meaningful long-term learning success. Using these skills helped me attain a job offer as the director of golf at Golf Digest Top 100 in the World Ranked Course after I completed their influence and communication courses but don't just take my word and the 97 percent five star reviews it has had on trustpilot for it try it yourself all you have to do is email david at suada.com that's s-u-a-d-a.com and quote the modern club management podcast to claim your free enrollment onto the reciprocity course to start your journey to become a more influential and persuasive communicator Welcome to the Modern Club Management Podcast with me, your host, Ed Chapman. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by my good friend, Tim Neal. Tim is the COO and co-founder of First Try Inc, based in Seoul, South Korea. Prior to this, Tim was the chief executive of Gala Golf Club in Oman and general manager of Abadia Golf Club in Dubai. Tim started his career working at clubs in the southeast of England. Tim, welcome to the show and thank you for joining me. Absolute pleasure. Very happy to be here. So South Korea will be a country that not everyone is familiar with. I know one of the primary reasons you ended up there is because your wife is Korean. However, for those who aren't aware, can you tell me a bit about the size of the golf industry in Korea? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting place, Korea, because it's actually the third largest golf market in the world. Uh, behind the US and Japan. And per capita, you know, Koreans actually spend more on equipment and apparel than any other country. Um, So it's a huge industry, Um, you know, in terms of kind of golf facilities, it's about 550 golf clubs uh, across Korea. So relatively small considering it's the third biggest market, but it's, um, it's, it, it has very unique sides to it. And I think um, just because the popularity of golf is so high and the facilities is relatively small is you've seen the kind of the, um, the development of these companies such as Golf Zone, these indoor studios, um, and, you know, and the, the incredible technology they have here you know, in the Golf Zone facilities. And a lot of that is is based around obviously access um, to golf courses is incredibly difficult. I think you know even through the last year or so of the pandemic, um, golf courses have been you know booked up five to six weeks in advance. I mean it's um, it's incredibly difficult to get to get tee times. But even before that, you know, screen golf gave um, an opportunity for you know, for everyone to have access to golf. Um, the golf courses themselves are expensive. Um, you know, I think on a weekend, if you've got change from $300, you're, you know, you're doing well. And then you have caddy fees and car fees. So it, it is expensive. And, and historically, it's been very probably tailored towards, you know, um, CEOs, corporate companies, MDs, you know, it's very much leans that way. So it's to screen golf and golf zone, as an example, you know, they saw these huge opportunities to 
to create something different. And now 85% of facilities are indoor screen golf. So it's a very unique, very different kind of market. Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, super, super busy. And just to put that into context for people, with 550 clubs, the population's around 50 million, is it? Or 58 million, so, I'm going to yeah, say. 58 million and only 550 courses. If you compare that to the UK with a population just over 70 million and over 2,000 odd courses, it's yeah quite a big difference in availability. And as you say, with screen golf being such a popular thing over there, when I was in Hong Kong, we had Golf Zone, and it is amazing the technology with the moving platform to simulate sloping lies. And just on that, with then your company, can you tell us a bit about the history behind it, what its objectives are, and the kind of main things you're looking to do and your club company's vision? Yeah, so we we established our company in coming up to about a year ago. Um, yeah, our company first try Inc. Um, I have a Korean uh, business partner here. Um, and initially, we were we were discussing, you know, what opportunities are there in in Korea? Um, for for us, uh, trying to utilize our expertise. Um, you know, we come from very, me and my business partner come from very different um, backgrounds. Me, obviously, from golf, golf resorts. And um, and my business partner is a, is very different in the sense he has worked in uh, the fashion industry um, for, you know, uh, over a decade um, in senior roles uh, with big companies like Hyundai Group. And um, so we started... Um, the company, we launched um, a, a putter brand called Bloodline Golf. And you may be aware of Bloodline, um, which was started by Brad Adams, the son of Gary Adams, the founder of TaylorMade. Um, and Brad himself was one of the founders of Odyssey and Never Compromise. And he has a, a co-founder, Larry Bishman, who was the um, the main guy behind the Dianama Shaft range. So they obviously this this company has a lot of um, you know expertise in the golf industry. And and Brad, with the you know the the family history, that's hence the name Bloodline. And um, so we we started out as the distributor for uh, for Bloodline in in Korea, but it's evolved. Um, we've evolved that brand and, uh, we're now moving into, into fashion and accessories, um, and, and trying to create this total golf brand. Um, and we've been lucky enough. We, you know, we've gone through our seed investment. We've been very, very lucky in getting uh, a great strategic investor, uh, on board to help us scale and accelerate our growth, um, which has been fantastic. And our, our investor is one of the, uh, is the biggest online fashion platform in Korea, which is, you know, and they not only does that open certain doors for us, but they also want to scale their golf uh, element to their platform as well. So that's one of our verticals. Um, we also um, are developing golf academies, um, and we're working with one of the uh, golf's major governing bodies at the moment in establishing um, the, which will be the leading facility in Korea for, uh, in terms of a golf academy, facilities, infrastructure, you know, uh, the modern, modernization of the facility, the technology. So that's um, very much a big part of what, my role is within the company is leading that development um, and we're working with uh, uh, one of the major companies here who actually owns five golf resorts here in Korea but also uh, one in California and one in Japan so it's a, a big company but also have um, you know big ambition in creating something special in Korea so that's so we're very fortunate to be to be involved in that project and We'll be making some an announcements um, very soon, which, um, you know, will be uh, just to highlight the project and, and the scale of the project that we're involved in. Um, and then thirdly, uh, if our third vertical is um, we 
try uh, well we build relationships with um, international companies so whether that's you know trademark licensing um, and trying to help brands um, either introduce them to the Korean market develop their brand enhance their brand equity uh, here in Korea and so we've been working with um, some international companies that we've um, we've been bringing in um, to um, yeah, to, to kind of diversify and, and expand their, their, their presence here in Korea. So our objectives um, very much based around, I think this goes back and it's conversations we've had offline many times is, you know, I was very keen to, to start to develop my own company. Um, and I think that, um, you know, building my company uh, from an incorporating perspective, a legal perspective, actually um, understanding the intricacies that go into building a company and then, you know, building something from the ground up that is, you know, it's kind of yours. It's, um, y you can develop the culture, you can develop the, you know, uh, the team that you want around you. Um, and that for me was super exciting. So we've got, as I mentioned, we've got all these verticals that are going on. We're now building our team. So we've just hired now a sales director. We've got designers that have come on board. Um, so we're, we're kind of building out. And um, yeah, it's busy. It's, it's really, really busy. All exciting stuff. So a couple of things I want to pull on the thread of. Firstly, with the overseas companies, is that something that you approach people you feel will be a good market fit for Korea? Is that companies that have approached you? How's the balance been of that? One of the, the strengths of um, certainly my business partner and his expertise in the industry has also been his network. Um, and quite often we will have one of the big fashion companies um, that know we have uh, connections globally um, or have the ability to make those connections. And sometimes, effectively, they will engage us to say, look, you know, this is a brand that we feel we can, you know, uh, we can make a success here, whether that is through department stores or, you know, uh, home shopping networks, which in Korea is uh, the number one distribution channel and um, very different perception here to, to perhaps, you know, we're used to, uh, you know, back in the West, it's, um, you know, all the premium brands use it as a, as a sales channel. Um, so it, it's kind of worked both ways where the big companies will approach us to look, or there's, there's other, other brands. Um, you know, there's, there's some that we're talking to at the moment, uh, involved in the golf industry that we've made connections with. And I think that again, with our expertise in the golf industry, um, is it, it gives us a little bit, you know, more opportunity to have those discussions and bring those brands into Korea because, you know, for the for Western brands, it's um, it's a very very not difficult place to do business, but it's it's a, you really have to understand not only the the business practices but the culture and the business culture, and I think that's where we have that kind of you know that's a great value add that we can give to, you know, potential partners. Well, that's certainly a big thing in Korea, especially the whole, how you do business, the easy, how to, to do a cultural faux pas of the incorrect greeting and understanding the different social media to use, how cacao talk so big as a, as social media in Korea, more so I'd, I'd understand than a lot of the Western social media companies. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, Kakao is, um, for those of those of you who don't know Kakao, Kakao is effectively the Korean WhatsApp. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm doing it no justice in saying that it's a huge company here that, you know, they're a company that IPO'd a few years ago. And they have, um, I mean, they have a, a variety of different um, aspects to their business. So they're involved in golf. So Kakao Screen Golf, uh, it's called Kakao Friends, Kakao Friends Academies. Um, so they have all these luxury um, 
indoor studios across Korea. Um, Kakao Taxi um, is, you know, the, it's, uh, you know, similarly to other, other apps you can get anywhere, whether it's Uber or something, but Kakao is the most popular um, app that you can use to, to, for, for taxis and, and travel. Uh, Kakao Pay, it's, they have a bank side to the business. So it's this huge company that simply started out as a, as a messaging um, you know, service provider. So, yeah, um, yeah it's the, it is the kind of the, the main channel here. Yes, uh, local expertise always so critical in these things. And then the other thread I want to pull at, you talked about working with a major governing body. Can you just give us some background on to kind of the process behind kind of from the initiation of that through to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. So there's in Korea, um, and I, th- I think culturally, there is there's a there's a lot of synergy between the West and Korea. And this goes historically since post Korean War, where the West has had such a, a strong involvement in the uh, the development of Korea, um, you know, post war into, you know, the thriving economy it is now. Um, and so there's a lot of respect for uh, international brands here. And so we, the, we, we had a concept which was we wanted to bring in one of the, the major governing bodies into Korea um, that uh, would be able to do something slightly different to anything that's available in Korea. Um, from an education standpoint, from certain uh, curriculums within golf, uh, golf coaching and, and developing golf professionals. Um, and, but something that had, you know, the brand power. Um, and so it was, it was about, okay, well, what is missing in the Korean industry? You know, what is a problem that we can solve, you know? Uh, and, Korean golf professionals, um, just as an example, um, to become a KPGA member, um, it's very much based on the playing side. Um, Then in terms of actual formal education, it's four days. Um, Whereas, you know, you and I as as PGA GB&I or whether you're PGA of Australia or PGA of America, it's a, you know, it's a four a three and a half, four, five year um, program that you go through, um, university program, and which opens your, you know, the opportunity to various parts of the the business, whether it is coaching the business, uh, you know, rules or whatever, whatever side of the business it is you're you're looking at, you get this training in every element, and that for career was a huge opportunity. To actually say, well, do you know what? You can go through a formal training um, for X number of years that will give you a qualification at the end and a qualification that is um, globally recognized, has immense credibility. Um, because, you know, as I mentioned, 85% of, uh, of, of uh, golf is indoor screen golf. Every academy probably has five to six professionals their KPGA or maybe USGTF or uh, um, KLPGA. Um, so, it was, so it was about establishing an idea um, that how we could support Korean development. Um, so the first thing we had to do was obviously speak to the KPGA as the governing body here. Um, you know, it's not as if we can just come in and we have carte blanche to do what we want. You know, we want to work closely with the other associations. So, you know, the KPGA, um, the vice chairman is a, is a close friend of ours. Um, and the, they were incredibly supportive um, to say, OK, well, this is this is going to add value to the Korean golf industry, add value to our members, to professionals. Uh, it gives them the opportunity to have, um, you know, dual membership with the KPGA and, and, and you know, whatever governing body. Um, and just for your listeners, I, I, I can't um, say the name just yet uh, because we'll be announcing something very soon. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it is, 
it's been really good to be able to kind of collaborate and get the buy-in from the local um, the local PGA, uh, local governing body. And then it was just about, okay, right, we've got this idea. We've got the representation from um, this governing body. We have got the buy-in from the local um the local authority and then it's just about okay well finding the right opportunity so the interest was incredibly high um you know it's it's a great idea it will add great value to any facility um so we were we were just meeting and discussing with you know various um facilities uh you know owners of of facilities to see what would be the right fit for us and you know and we 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 found a great partner who shares the vision um who wants to create something special um and you know create effectively the home of golf if you like in korea um but it also allows us to scale and to develop other facilities across korea and and grow that that side so yeah it's kind of taking an idea getting the buy in from the relevant organizations and then finding the right partner um and that has been 18 months uh, it's not been a slow process uh, a quick process it's been you know um a process of just making sure we did things the right way An exciting project it sounds like and yeah it's it's bound to take a bit of time when you've got big organizations that you're trying to bring together and marry a vision you talked a bit there about building a facility. Can you give some insight into that process as well and where you are on that? Yeah. So, um, I mean, one of the, maybe just going back to what we were saying about the types of facilities in Korea. So with 550 golf courses, I would say less than 10% have a uh, subject. Sorry, I'm speaking Korean, um, <laughs> a driving range um have a driving range um and a lot of that is due to um uh the the in terms of the process of applying for land to develop um korea um is incredibly mountainous um and you know so so a lot of the golf course development are in the mountain uh mountainside mountain regions so it's um so space is very very important and obviously developing something on the side of a mountain is incredibly costly so a lot of facilities won't invest into the practice facility but also there is a a korean culture we call it a bali bali mentality in bali bali means quickly quickly so um when you've got seven minutes between tea times you know everything's moving quickly you've got full golf courses Nobody is interested in uh, hitting balls before they go. It's just a completely different, different concept. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So this, so the where we are, we're going to be in an urban environment, and the best practice facilities at the moment, you you really have to go outside of the cities, outside of Seoul or, or whatever city it is, to find something with um, you know great great practice facilities. For example, Sky Seventy Two. Uh, which, you know, people may have heard of in Incheon. Um, it probably has the best practice facilities in, in Korea. And Ed, I know, you, you know, you were there with me uh, maybe five years ago. It, it uh, was, we had a look at Sky yeah. and the facilities are... Oh, it's amazing. It's, it's the hard. The facilities are incredible. It is. And it's for people who haven't don't know it, it's a driving range, but it's actually a complete circle with bays all the way around. So it's like almost like a stadium and it's is it 350, 400 yards across. So I think it, I think it's, yeah, about 400, 400. yeah, 400 yards across. Yeah, so you, you're safe unless you got, I guess, Deshaun Bow hitting and it's just incredible size of facility with, is it 15 academies based around it? Something like that. Yeah, it is quite incredible to see. Minimum. Yeah. 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 And then all around the outside is all, you know, practice greens. I think there's maybe 10 greens in, in total. Um, so it's this huge, huge facility, but that's near Incheon airport, you know, the main international airport, which outside of Seoul is probably 
an hour to an hour and a half. So accessibility is, you know, is difficult. So creating something within the, you know, the urban city environment that is going to be of that stature or, you know, uh, what we're planning will be uh, potentially different, but, um, you know, um, but very, very similar. Um, it, you've got, obviously, you've being in the city, you've got great demand generators from obviously local communities. This project will also involve residences um, and the opportunity for stay and play and, and packages. There's two 18-hole country clubs on site um, with another nine-hole course. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, uh, big in terms of, of what it is. So, so in terms of the, the facility, um, yeah, so we're looking at um, indoor studios. Um, it will be a two-sided range. So the academy side that we will be effectively operating will be on 2,000 meter, uh, square meters of hitting turf, uh, four to five indoor studios, um, you know, all with state-of-the-art technology, indoor putting studios, um, and range bays, uh, covered range bays as well. And the other side will be, you know, um, for public use, uh, you know, kind of one of these three-story, 100-plus uh, bay facilities um, because there is the demand there for it. Um, and then there will be development of some of the nine-hole course into short game area, into a potential par three course. So, so at the moment, we are just working with uh, design teams um, on the concept, uh, construction teams on obviously the development uh, and we're close to you know getting to um, a concept that we're all we're all happy with and hopefully we'll be breaking ground uh, if not late this year early next year exciting good times ahead then one of the things mm. i think that's interesting with korean golf is how the klpga is really the dominant force with with women's golf being the most watched and followed tour in Korea ahead of the men's which is I'd suspect probably one of the only countries in the world where that's the case is that something quite culturally obviously Seri Pak started this off in the late 90s is that something you, you find as well that women's golf is really the big thing yeah it, it is um, you know it's it, there's some really interesting dynamics here I mean you've got the two main tours, as you said, the KPGA and the KLPGA, and the KLPGA tour gets much more um, coverage on TV. Uh, you know, attendances and, and spectator crowds are bigger. Um, there's much more focus on uh, the KLPGA. And, yeah, a lot of that is, you know, you rightly said, you've got a lot of these um, these superstars that have come out of Korea, whether it was Seri Park, kind of the... I suppose the mother of Korean golf, um, and then Imbi Park, um, you know Sung Kyun Park, some of these big, uh, you know, major winners now Chun Inji or Inji Chun, um, you know. So I think there was a, at some stage over the, and I'm sure maybe it's similar now, but um, you know, in the last couple of years, you, you could probably say in the top twenty players, twelve are from South Korea. You know, there were some really interesting statistics, but it is um, golf in Korea. I think um, it's still very much in its infancy, although it's the third biggest market. There is still this um, there's a lot that still needs to be developed, that still needs to be, um, you know, refined. And, um, you know, and because they've created all these 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 superstar lady golfers and I mean if you're on the ground here to see what that actually look like you know looks like why is Korea developing so many um, I think a lot of it is down to the culture um, and you know it's this mentality of just super super hard work um, it's also the, um, you know, you referred to it in, in the business scenario earlier, but there is very much a respect culture here. Um, you know, hence why I said Chun Inji and not Inji Chun, 
because Koreans will always put their family name before their individual name because family comes before the individual. Um, and when it's in that, that you know, whether, whether you have a kid who's involved in uh, golf or piano or, you know, any other kind of discipline, they very, very much pay attention to what the parents want. Um, and that is very good in some ways. Makes your life easier very... as a parent. It, it does. <laughs> it, well, yeah, well, mine's a, mine's a, yeah, he's a muggle. So he's... Um... He listens to, to his mum, but not his dad, you mean? He listens. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm the pushover. Um so yeah, I think there's there's those cultural nuances, um, but also you know I think you would probably find the men's game would be and look look if you look at the men's game now you know with Kang with uh, si, uh, Kim Si Woo and um, you know Im and the uh, Jung who was Asian Tour who's now in the pre they're all playing Presidents Cup, you know you're seeing the men's game now flourish a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, some of the cultural hindrances to the men's game has been, you know, they still have mandatory military service in Korea. Um, so you've got, you know, young guys from the age of 18 to 21 who are having to go into two to three year, you know, military service. So it's not great for, uh, you know, those real key years. It's obviously it's not not great for Um so I think there's th th those are some of the cultural issues, um, but also I mean we were talking about you know Sky seventy two and this this stadium driving range and twenty academies around it. So if twenty academies have let's say ten students, you've got two hundred kids um, all around Sky seventy two. Um, if one of them makes it on the KLPGA or KPJ tour. That's, I mean, that's fantastic. Um, you know, if one of them makes it into the top 100 in the world, I mean, it's, it's, that's incredible. But that's just one facility across Korea. Um, and the, the difficulty with the Korean model is they've got a lot of high production in terms of, you know, there's, the pool is so deep of players. But you get a lot of these, um, these young athletes that don't go to school. Uh, because there are, you know, dispensations where, if you are an elite in a particular um, category, whether it is, you know, music, art, sport, whatever, you get relief from certain parts of education. So, yeah, there's a lot. It's, it's, um, there's a lot that's invested into kids. There's a lot of high pressure. Um, if they don't make it, what is kind of the next, you know, what is, what, what do they do after that? And, you know, I know from experience that, you know, supporting one kid, um, you know, through the playing season across Korea can be, you know, three to $5,000 a month. Um, it's super, super expensive. So yeah, it's, um, it's a different, it's just a very, very different model. Um, and, um, you know, but beyond all that, they just love golf. They are absolutely obsessed with the game, which, which is, you know, for me is the one thing I, well, one of the reasons I love being here is, you know, it's, it's the only place I think in the world where you can be in the middle of Seoul and someone's walking down the street with a gold bag <laughs> on their back and it doesn't look out of place. So before, we, before we move on, there's a couple of things about Korea I still want to talk about. The first one would be what are two or three brands, whether that's golf clothing or golf equipment that maybe haven't got out of Korea yet, which you think are just fantastic brands that people should be aware of? Oh, great question. I think from an equipment perspective, um, you know, uh, TaylorMade, for example, and Titleist, are, they're, they're owned by Korean companies. Um, you know, I think now Fila owns Titleist, uh, which is, and Fila is a Korean company. And then there's a Korean, uh, group that now own TaylorMade. Um, so from, a, uh, from a, a club perspective, you know, they're still, you know, they're very much, you know, involved with what's going on. But I think the, the real, um, the real thing people should pay attention to is Korean golf fashion. 
Um, it is, I mean, every time you go to a, a country club, it's like, you, you know, you, you, it's, it's literally like a, a fashion show. People are on a catwalk. It's head to toe. People really invest into what they're wearing. Um, and so a couple of brands that I think people should, um, you know, maybe pay attention to, uh, the, the Korean brands, um, there's a couple, there's a couple of new ones. I mean, some of the big, the big ones here are like whack golf, uh, whack, which you probably see players like Kevin Na where, uh, whack, yeah, it's a, uh, I it's think like stands a, for winner at all costs. Yeah. And it's like a devil logo. I think. That, yeah. 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 So that's, um, that, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty cool brand here. You've got, um, new brands, uh, um, Vertum, uh, which is a, a, a local Korean guy, um, you know, fashion designer had a, a concept and got major investment and they've, they've really scaled. Um, another one is A New, A New. And um, so Charlie Hull, um, uh, Yalima No, um, some of the, the girls are wearing A New. So if you, you know, if you watch the, the LPJ tour, you'll see some of the stuff they're wearing. The, I mean, the A new stuff is it's super fresh and sexy. It's cool, really nice, uh, trendy stuff. And they started out with accessories, and then grew and developed into into their their, their fashion brand. Um, so those those are some of the brands that I would you know if I was um, you know maybe back west and looking to at some something that was going to be a little bit different. You know those those brands for sure, um, but you know, it's very difficult. It's a really, really difficult market. I mean, because you've got maybe 120 new brands that enter the market every year, um, you've got a small percentage that actually um, find traction. um, And the ones that do will generally have a three year life cycle. Um, And the reason is, is because the trends are moving so, so fast. Um, There's so much change that's happening. And um, and what you do find is, so, you know, some of the apparel brands, whether it's Titleist, uh, TaylorMade or Callaway, just an example, um, you know, the, the apparel that they're developing is nothing like we would see back home or, or in the US or Europe. It's, I mean, it's very, very different. Um, and what you find is the the brands that have the longevity are generally the legacy brands. It's the Titleist, the TaylorMade, the Callaway, the ones that have that total package. Um, and the golf fashion brands, they generally will have a three to five year life cycle. So it's, it's incredibly difficult and competitive. But yeah, look out for those brands, a new particularly. Mm. Very cool. Okay, I'll link to their websites in the show description. Sounds exciting and an interesting market. And I've noticed that when I've been to Korea, just how fashionable and trendy everyone's dressed all the time it is quite amazing to see yeah, golf is definitely secondary yes yeah it's how you look far more important <laughs> and from a cost perspective i think you said before to me about 200 us dollars would be pretty average for people to spend on a golf shirt yeah um so if you if you went to kind of the top brands like a new for example yeah you would be for a basic uh, kind of polo, yeah, north of 200. And with the exchange rate now, uh, you know, it's probably closer to $300. Right. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, super, super expensive. Mm, so uh, 300 US. But quality, I mean, quality is, is there. very, very yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So one, one comment on Korea, you said earlier about how much it's grown, just to give people outside of Korea a context. So since 1980, the GDP per capita in the UK has grown by 5x. And in the same time period in Korea, it's grown by 20x. So it has had this yeah. huge, huge development over there. And the, one, one book I'd recommend people to read if they want to learn more about the history of Korea a bit or the modern history, it's called New Koreans. And I think the author is Michael Breed. But I'll link to that in the show as well. That was a really interesting book that, that I've read. So moving on, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask you, Tim. If you could go back to your younger self during your first general manager role, what advice would you give yourself? 
Ooh. What advice would I give myself? Um, I think like, like most new general managers, club managers is there's, there's definitely a, a want to, uh, be perfect, um, to, um, to be very focused on what other people are thinking. And this, and this, I, I guess I would say back, go back to myself and say, do you know what? It's okay to make mistakes. Because, yes, yes, we learn from them um, and it, it makes us better operators, um, you know, providing they're not big mistakes. Um, but what it also does is, um, is if, if, you, if you make a mistake, you learn from it and you, um, you grow as an individual. The one thing is, is it's, it's infectious to your team. It makes your team also understand that, you know what, um, it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to learn from it. It's okay to, um, to at least try and fail and go again. Um, and I think that's probably what I, I know in my first GM role. Um, yeah, it was very much about, you know, I, 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 I felt like I was, um, you know, I had to really show that I was already the finished article. And I think that's the thing I would probably say is, um, yeah, make, make some mistakes. Uh, it's okay to do it and you will learn from it. And so will your, you know, people in your care. In the last five years, what new belief, behavior or habit has most improved your life? Oh, other than learning uh, the Korean. Last five, other than learning Korean. Um, oh. Hanguk mal chin oil. That means Korean is very difficult. Um, the uh, oh, okay. I would say I'm gonna I'm gonna approach this um, from two perspectives. One from a personal is obviously becoming a father. Um, I mean, you were. I remember you visited us uh, five years ago for Louis's first birthday uh, in in Korea, and um, yeah, that has been. Yeah, that has been an unbelievable journey so far. You know, the fact that you have somebody in your care, the fact that it, it, it makes the decisions that you make um, that much more, um, you know, uh, important uh, because you're, you're always obviously thinking about the, the impact and the influence that you're having over someone else. And then I think... Um, one of the best skills that I've learned, and I think this is probably because of the international roles that I've had, is listening. But when I say, I mean, really listening. Um, you know, I think we all create our own map of the world and, you know, what is important to us. But I think the great thing about working internationally and exposing yourself to different cultures is, do you know what, you really have to listen. You really have to respect, you know, other people's point of view, perspectives. Um, so that's been a great skill for me to uh, to develop over probably more than five years. But it's a skill that I'm I, I feel like I'm trying to get better at every day. Touching back on Louis's first birthday, for those of you who aren't familiar with Korean culture, I thought it would be a cake and some balloons and some other one year olds for a party. Little did I know that actually the first birthday is really the biggest. Uh, birthday celebration for kids in Korea and that's historically because of child mortality rates being so poor past history so it is a big big amazing celebration to to see and just emphasize again how different all cultures are and how it's so fascinating getting to see them one final question on this section what advice would your 10 year older self give you now my 10 year old self no your 10 year older oh. self Oh, okay. Okay. Because I think my 10 year old self would say, why didn't you practice harder? <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why didn't we win the masters? Um, oh, my, my 10 year older self, um, what advice would he give me now? That's a, that's a great question. I think he would, my 10 year older self would, would, would maybe say, you know, um, trust your instincts. Uh, they've gotten us this far and we're still alive. 
But what I mean is, you know, and you and I have spoken about this many times, and I think it was maybe Steve Jobs who said, you know, it's easy to connect the dots looking backwards, but not looking forwards. And, and I think if you told me 10 years ago, I would, um, I'd, cause I was, you know, I was in the U S before Dubai. And then if I went to, I was going to go to Dubai, meet a, a Korean girl, get married, move to Korea, then move back to the Middle East to Oman for three years, then come back to Korea, have, you know, have a son. Um, I would say, you're crazy. Um, that was never, and, and I think, yeah, I've just kind of trusted my instincts, kind of gone with it, not, um, not tried to, uh, yeah, um, not not try to to focus too much on um, you know. I think sometimes in this industry we can get a little bit focused on you know what job title do I have next? What um, you know? Am I following some kind of linear path? Whereas I would just say that you know to anyone or to my my ten year older self would might say to me is just follow experiences. Um, if you follow experiences, great experience, you're generally going to move in the right direction. So you've recently completed a master's degree in law, international law specifically? International business law, my master's was, yeah. So what would be two or three key learnings that you took from that, which you'd recommend listeners to pay attention to when negotiating or signing contracts? Or, approach? well, uh, you know, I'll probably, I'll give a very, uh, maybe a bit more generic mm. because the you know the concept of a contract is is very much the same across um you know depending whether it's an employment contract a commercial contract you know something that you've got with a supplier you're paying for a goods and service i would say from a commercial standpoint you know when you're dealing with any suppliers or or or, or similar i would say the three most important things and the first thing is balance um now um balance in a contract is the most important thing because effectively each party is trying to gain something from it and if you can maximize the gains for each party um that's the benefit to the contract and contracts that are hugely biased in one direction which can often be between smaller organizations and bigger organizations um, you know, these are the things you want to avoid. It, you want to try and create balance because there are also laws that protect small organizations for unfair contracts. You have the Unfair Contracts Act 1977. God, you're trying, uh, trying to think back to my, <laughs> my study. Um, that's UK, UK. And, um, you know, so there's, there's lots of provisions. So the, the whole premise of a contract is that Parties are there to help each other and get the maximum from it. I'd say probably the second thing is you want to remove any ambiguity from the contract. Um, and what I mean by that is quite often if you, if you ever get into any dispute, if, if, a, if a clause or a part of the contract is ambiguous, you know, you can have two parties reading the same clause coming to a different conclusion, um, which is definitely something you want to avoid. So I think you know, when you are looking at the actual terms and the, you know, the, the, the meat and bones of a contract is really understand, you know, what are the rights of each party and what are the remedies available, not to, not to be ambiguous in any way that a party sees something completely different. So just make sure you're on the same page. And then I'd probably say from a commercial perspective is understand your exit options, you know, because if a contract turns bad or a company um, gets itself into a difficult situation, um, you need to understand, OK, well, what is our exit opportunities um, to get out of this contract? And I think if you focused on those three things, the balance, um, the ambiguity, making sure each party is, knows what they're signing into and what options are available to exit. And then from an employment standpoint, I think, you know, you've always got the employee who is looking for job security. And then you've got the employer who is looking for, um, you know, labor certainty. 
Um, you know, and so again, you're trying to establish this balance. Um, so from an employee perspective, um, you know, if you're looking to sign a contract, you're certainly looking for, you know, compensation and benefits. Um, you know, that has to be laid out. Um, you're understanding, okay, what are my employee rights? Um, so what, what am I entitled to under law in terms of, um, you know, annual leave, all these kinds of intricacies. But, you know, you and I have worked into the, in Dubai as expats and there's certain regulations that, um, you know, uh, in terms of gratuity that you really need to, you know, you need to have a handle on to, under, you know, understand that. And from an employee perspective, an employer perspective, um, you know, similarly, uh, you want to protect, you know, certainly confidentiality. Um, you know, if you are employing someone that, you know, needs to protect company secrets, it, you know, or they're going to develop something, uh, understanding those IP rights remain with the company. Um, and again, you know, termination. Um, if that contract needs to be terminated, um, make sure you are doing things the right way and things are written the right way. And obviously people have legal counsel. They have law firms that can do this. But, you know, you and I, again, have worked in the Middle East and to fire an Emirati uh, or an Omani is, you know, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. Um, but you would have to follow the right processes. If you're in Korea, it's incredibly difficult to fire somebody. Uh, it's not like the US where things are a little, you know, a little bit easier. Uh, Korea is very difficult. So you, there's, there's certain legalities as a company you need to understand. Um, and that's, that is something I would, I, would, um, I would definitely recommend. And maybe just to finish that off, if you are, you know, um, if you're an executive, for example, um, you know, executives, you may want to, uh, uh, you know, really consider what is the severance. Um, because a lot of executives may have equity in the company, you know, be on a stock option plan or something. And so understanding, you know, how does that option vest over a number of years? And then how can I actually, um, once I leave the company, how can I realize those options? Um, and also if something is sev you know, severed, what are the options available to me? Um, so I think, again, it's just about what is the balance between the contract and, uh, and making sure that, you know, you are aware of the, you know, the, the overarching laws. And I would just recommend to any club manager, any, any GM is have a, have an, have an understanding of that. Um, don't leave it to your HR. Don't leave it to, you know, uh, legal departments actually have an invested interest because um, uh, it will, it will add huge value to you. Mm. Balance is a good word there. I think it, sometimes if contracts and negotiations people can reach for that pyrrhic victory of transactional one-upmanship on someone rather than that more relational longer term balance of actually getting an employee for the lowest possible salary actually maybe isn't the target it's getting because then one side's going to be unhappy longer term having that that balance of both sides wishes and needs being met yeah, certainly an important part of it. One, Absolutely. One final question before we move on to our last short section. What did you learn from your master's? And by that, I don't mean subject specific. What did you learn skill-wise or about yourself from the process of completing it? I certainly for myself when I finished my master's, my critical thinking went through the roof in how I, I approached things and challenged my own thinking with that would certainly be something that I took from mine? Great question. Um, I, I think before you, you embark on any higher education, um, obviously you're doing it for a particular reason. Um, you know, I know the reasons you did yours. Um, you know, I did mine because I, I wanted to create a, a company and work internationally. Um, so I, I, I took my, my law degree you know, into that special area with the masters. And um, so I think what I kind of got out of it was the one thing about doing any law degree, you know, whether it's, a, you know, your 
Juris Doctor or it's your Masters, it's a hell of a lot of reading. <laughs> it is, you know, you're talking, and especially I was doing mine with a young, young, you know, a young son and, and, and a family. And, you know, you're talking about 3, 4 a.m., you know, uh, you know, reading and reading and articles and things like that. I think one thing I learned was, is that um, uh, I'm pretty good at reading. No, I'm joking. Um, is that I really, really had a deep interest into what I was, what I was studying. And my fear was always, okay, well, at the end of this, Am I going to, okay, well, I've got, I now have a master's, I have this, and I'm now going to, you know, detract from, you know, that. But I haven't. It's, it's really sparked an interest to continually develop. I, I'm just enrolling into um, a commercial, international commercial contracts course with Harvard University. Um, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really kind of just uh, given me a bit of ignition to want to do more. To, to, to go further. And I think um, that's probably the one thing I learned about myself at the end of it is that it, it kind of gave me a bit of fire in the belly to, to keep pursuing, keep moving forward in that direction. Because, yeah, I think sometimes when you get these things, you've got a certificate and people will just hang it on the wall and, you know, remember what you can remember. And, you know, I know from you and what you've, you know, the, you know, with the, what you're doing with the uh, CMAE and, and the book club and the reading, the continual reading, you know, trying to, you know, invest your time in what you've also studied as well. And I think, um, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing I've learned. Why should everyone visit Korea? I'm going to guess a lot of people listening to this haven't visited. And if you could tell them to go <laughs> at one time of year to visit one place, what should they do? Oh, wow. Okay, right. So why should you uh, visit Korea? Unbelievably safe, unbelievably efficient. Um, you know, that is from um, anything from technology to public transport to, to ever. It is just super, super efficient, super clean and modern. Um, but uh, more importantly, the food is incredible. Um, so uh, lots of um, lots of uh, amazing food that you can experience while you're here, and the best time to come uh, would be spring or autumn. And the spring, I would say, more so because we have cherry blossom. Um, so you know, it's just absolutely stunning here um, in the spring. Um, really, really beautiful. And then autumn. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're a mountainous com country with, you know, and the mountains are tree lined. So you could just imagine the autumn colors across the mountains. So autumn is, is lovely. The summer can just get a little hot and humid. Um, and the winters are bitter. So yeah, spring and summer, spring and spring and autumn, spring and autumn. Nice food wise. Then last question, what's your favorite dish? And that's hard. Cause I know, cause there's a lot of good ones. My one's probably jampong, which is a, spicy seafood mm -hmm. noodle soup there's a lot of amazing ones but what would be your your one dish you'd you'd go for i would probably say because it's um it's korean soul food and it's you know koreans love barbecues um yeah and i would probably say my favorite is um samkyap sal um so basically uh, samkyap sal pork is, belly, is it? Uh, pork belly yeah. Uh, barbecue yeah pork mm. belly barbecue so sa so basically sam um means three um so basically it's the three layers of of fat you can get o capsal which is the five layer one uh, but sam capsal just because um yeah i mean it's it's obviously it's delicious but it's there's a culture around it this drinking culture this you know it's very much where groups of friends will get together and um yeah, my wife will kill me for saying Sam Kip, so. Um <laughs> there's, there's, as you said, there's plenty of stuff, but that's my my favorite. And I, I know that anyone who was visiting Korea and went to a, a Korean barbecue restaurant would not be disappointed, unless you're vegan. <laughs> that's true. They could have the lettuce. Oh, yeah, just the lettuce, yeah, I think. Yeah, Korean barbecue is amazing. Okay, well, Tim, thank you very much for joining me in this conversation.
it's been very interesting and lots of wise words from yourself and I would recommend everybody to visit Korea if they can and we look forward to hearing your big announcement your big announcement uh, when that's released as well absolutely no look forward to it and yeah thanks thanks for the invitation it was great to great to chat thank you for joining me on this journey as we dive into the world of club management i hope you enjoy listening to these conversations as much as i enjoy having them if you do enjoy and get value from them i have two small requests simply subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening app and leave a review and share it directly with someone whom you think would benefit from listening. If you're interested in being a guest on this show yourself, then you can reach out to me using the details in the show notes or email me modernclubmanagement at pm.me. In the show notes, you will also find a link to my bi-weekly newsletter that complements these conversations where you can sign up to receive these directly into your inbox so that you never miss out. Thanks for tuning in and have an amazing day.